Hi, welcome to this Oracle Developer Live session. My name is David Delabasse. I work in the Java Platform Group, and more specifically in the DevRel team of the Java Platform Group. So today we're going to discuss Java in two containers. Before we do so, I'd like to quickly look at the evolution of Java. So Java is 27 years old, and the Java has, has been evolved since then based on two core uh, ID, two core uh, tenets. One, developer productivity. So it has to be simple to write Java code, but also maintain Java code. And then uh, application performance. So it has to be simple to write performance uh, application. And that has been done in the face of constantly evolving factors, such as new programming paradigms. For example, in Java 8, Java started to adopt a more functional uh, approach with lambdas. Application style have also greatly changed in those uh, plus 25 years. So in the early days, uh, we were using client server, then we moved to monolith application, and those days, it's all about microservices. The hardware that we have access to is also a lot different than it used to be. Uh, it's not uncommon to have access to many cores. Uh, it's also quite common to have access to multi-terabyte heaps. We also have access to new architecture, ARM64, for example, and so on and so on. And last but not least, the deployment styles are also evolving. In the early days, we were, talking, we were deploying application uh, on-premises, then to data center, and now it's about deploying application in the, in the cloud. And clearly, containers are a key enabler of that movement. So uh, let's talk about containers. Now, containers in 2020 are omnipresent. So I assume that uh, most of you are already familiar with containers. I'm pretty sure that uh, well, you are already uh, using container containers today. So I will just spend one or two minutes uh, to go over some uh, key concepts just to make sure that we are all on the same page. And then I will focus on uh, Java into containers. So what is a container? Well, simply put, a container is everything needed to run an application and that is packaged into its own bundle, so its own deployment unit. So this includes uh, the application, uh, its dependencies, probably some configuration files, and potentially some other uh, bits and systems that may be needed to run that application. So at the end of the day, what you have is one single unit that you can easily deploy, that you can easily uh, move around. Under the hood, containers are made possible thanks to some uh, key uh, Linux, Linux technologies, such as namespace, uh, cgroups, LSN, so Linux security modules. So namespace is basically about who the container is allowed to talk to. Uh, cgroups is basically about the amount of resources that the container uh, can use, can consume. And LSM is obviously about security, so who the container is able to, what the container is allowed to do. Now, uh, containers offers a lot of benefits. Uh, we have this bundle that includes everything to run the application, so it, that offers some kind of isolation. Uh, that also offers some ability to do some meter execution, so you can uh, meter basically what resources are consumed when that container runs. Um, and also, from a development point of view, from a developer standpoint, containers are very useful because we have this ability now to easily create a complex environment made of multiple uh, software stack that we can easily uh, recreate. Uh, so we can dispose of them and then recreate them from scratch, something that is now uh, possible thanks to containers. Now, if we look at uh, the landscape, there are many container solutions. Uh, Docker, Cryo, Elixir, and so on and so on. So today I'm going to just talk about one, uh, that is Docker, because it's the most widely known uh, solution. But keep in mind that at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, most of the container solution Linux are relying on the same under the hood uh, technical capabilities. And uh, if you look, for example, at Podman, um, it goes as far as uh, offering the same tools so if you know how to use Docker, you, you know how to use Podman. So basically what I'm going to discuss today doesn't really apply uh, just to Docker. It just applies to uh, Java running into containers at large. Now, uh, I will quickly mention something that's the orchestration layers. Uh, you might want to have at some point in time, if you have a bunch of containers that needs to be uh, managed and scheduled, you might, have, you might want to have some uh, orchestration layers. And then Kubernetes comes to mind. But uh, that's all I'm going to say with uh, orchestration layers uh, today. Um, 
Now, very quickly, containers should not be confused with virtual machines. They both provide uh, some level of isolation. Obviously, a virtual machine provides a stronger isolation than a container. Uh, why? Because a VM relies on uh, hypervisors. Uh, so that gives some benefits, such as the ability, for example, to have on a different operating system, so a different guest operating system within the VM than the one that we have on the host, something that you sh you're not able to do with containers. Uh, obviously, the isolation is stronger, so it's more secure, uh, but that comes at a cost. Uh, Resource-wise, uh, VM are more expensive. And today, I'm going to just focus on containers because that's the topic. So, in a nutshell, how it works. So, you start from a Docker file. So, a Docker file is simply some kind of recipe that describes uh, your, what your container should be made of, what it should do. You then build it using Docker build, for example. What you obtain is a, a container image. You should see the container image as a, the equivalent of a Java class. That image is stored either locally, if it's for development, that's fine, but most of the time it's in a, in a registry. Um, Docker Hub, for example, but there are many other uh, registry possible. And then, obviously, you want to run uh, that containers. So uh, f when you run a Docker image, you will have a container instance. So you should see the container image as uh, the equivalent of a Java class. And the container instance basically has the, uh, the, the instance of that given uh, class. So that's basically the container that is running. And obviously, as I mentioned, you might want at some point in time, if you have multiple containers, that needs to be managed to have some kind of orchestration layer. So that's in a nutshell how containers work. Now, this is the traditional approach. So the Docker approach of uh, building and running a containers. Uh, Jib. Uh, is offering a different approach. I'm just going to focus on, on that one as it works with Docker and Podman. Now let's switch gear and talk about Java. So if we look at the GVM container landscape, it's pretty rich. There are a lot of solutions. Uh, IDs are able to deal with Docker files, uh, build tools. You can build, uh, you can containerize your application either from Maven or from Grails. We have test container. Uh, we have Jib and so on and so on. If you look on the other side at the microservices frameworks, most of them have the ability to easily containerize your application. So that's something that you don't have to deal with. Uh, that's something that will be provided by the frameworks itself. So that rich landscape is made possible, obviously, uh, thanks to all the container advancements that have been made in the last years, but also thanks to Java, because uh, a lot of investments have been made in Java to make sure that Java has been adapted and tuned for containers. And that's what we're going to uh, discuss. Now, when I say Java, I probably need to qualify what I mean by Java. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, when we look at the GDK, there are four key building blocks. Uh, there's the Java runtime, so the hotspot virtual machine. There's the Java language. Uh, there's a bunch of GDK APIs. And the GDK also comes with a set of tools. Now, something which is important, Java in itself, so the Java language is container agnostic. So there's nothing specific in the Java language related to containers. Now, when we look at the GVM, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of adaptation and tweaks and tuning have been done on the GVM to make sure that the GVM, the hotspot GVM, works and behaves correctly when it comes in when it's deployed and running into a container. So clearly, the GVM has to be container aware. A lot of investment have been done on, on that front. If we look at the GDK API, there are very uh, few APIs that are container specific. There are a few APIs that you can use to get some information about the containers, and that's basically uh, about it. Now, if we look at the GDK tools, uh, there are a few tools that come with the GDK that are useful when it comes to running and deploying Java application into containers. So today, I'm going to focus on the Java virtual machine, and I will also talk about some of the tools. And obviously, given the time constraint, I had to make choice. So the Java virtual machine. Uh, this is a very busy slide. Uh, don't try to read it. Uh, this is basically a, a curated list of fix and enhancements that have been done in the GDK to make sure that the hotspot uh, VM works and behaves correctly when it runs within a containers. Uh, 
please uh, rest assured I'm not gonna uh, go over all those enhancements but what you can get from that slide is that a lot of work has been done also if you look at um, the different release uh, that effort has started around Java 8 but if you look at the bottom of the slide you will see that uh, in Java 18 that we're launching this week uh, there are RFE specific to containers and there are also uh, another one that is coming in Java 19 so it's an ongoing effort it's not something that has been done in the past and we are done we are keep we are we are continuing the investment uh, in that front so the takeaway here a lot of work have been done in the platform to make sure that the gvm works nicely with containers so the first thing that I'm, I will talk about is the GVM ergonomics. It's not something new and it's not uh, something that is uh, container specific. So what are uh, the ergonomics of the GVM? Uh, it's basically the ability that the GVM has to auto-tune itself. So basically when it runs, the hotspot VM will look at some key metrics from the environments, such as uh, how many CPU does it have access to, what is the memory available, and so on and so on. And based on those few key metrics, it will set a default behavior that will give you uh, a good uh, performance. So you should see that as some kind of uh, introspection of the environment. And based on that, the GVM will auto-tune itself to make sure that it works correctly uh, if you don't specify any things. For example, the GC uh, will be automatically set based on those key metrics. The heap size will be set. Uh, the runtime compiler will also be set. The right runtime compiler will also be selected. Those kind of things that will be automatically set by the GVM. Now, uh, before we look at that in action, I want to quickly talk about CDS, class data sharing. So. Uh, CDS is not something new. It's something that has been introduced in Java 5, so quite a few years ago. But since then, CDS keeps evolving. So CDS goal is twofold. On one hand, it's about improving the startup time of Java application. And obviously, that's, gonna, that's a, something that will be useful when our Java application run within a containers. And on the other hand, uh, CDS can also reduce the memory footprints between multiple uh, GVM running on the same host. How does that work? Well, we have, a, we have to look at what happened under the hood when a Java application uh, is, lo is launched, as a lot of things, in fact, happen under the hood. So the GVM is launched. Uh, the GVM then has to load uh, that Java application. So that basically means that there are a bunch of classes that needs to be loaded, system classes, but also the classes from uh, your application. Loading class means most of the time uncompressed jar, read the class uh, from uh, read the class files, parse it, verify it, and then turn those class files into something that the GVM can use. So basically uh, turn that into an in-memory representation. And obviously, your application is not made of one single class. There are a lot of classes. So that's a lot of work. The key idea with CDS is that that work should only be done once. So basically, uh, your application will be started, so all those classes will be read, verified. Uh, the GVM will uh, will uh, turn that into something that is usable, so an in-memory representation, and then it will dump that uh, to the disk. So that the next time your application uh, starts, the GVM will just bring that uh, archive directly from memory uh, from the disk to to memory and it can uh, use that uh, in-memory representation directly. So it's a lot of work that uh, has been skipped, basically. So it improved the startup time of application. So as I mentioned, uh, CDS was introduced in Java 5. Um, back then, it was pretty limited, but now a lot of work has been done. So you can use uh, CDS for the classes of your own application. That's HAP CDS. CDS support, obviously, all the GCs, all the garbage collector of the GDK, and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, uh, CDS is a great tool to improve the startup time of Java application, including when they're running in containers. So let's have a quick demo. I'm going to use this. So let's see. Oops. So what I have here, a simple Docker file, um, pretty basic. So I use this base image, this random base image. I have a hello world class that I copy, compile and run it. If we look at that hello world, uh, it's basically some kind of hello world that look at some of the environment metrics and it's just displays that. So we can run that. 
hello world.java. So this is the result. So I'm using 18 early access build. Uh, it doesn't run, so my GVM doesn't run inside Docker. It has access, so the GVM sees a 12 core, so that basically means that the command for join pool will be set to uh, 11. Uh, so that's 12 minus one, and so on and so on. So th this is not really, uh, what the application does is not really important. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna containerize that application using that Docker file. Okay, so Docker build. Um, and this, we're going to call it test and we pass it uh, a context. So now we're going to run that application again. So uh, it was called test. Oh, sorry, that containerized application, Docker run. So now uh, you can notice that uh, the GVM is a, is a pretty old GVM. Uh, it runs within Docker's, right? Uh, it sees uh, six cores, so the command for join pool is configured at six minus one, that is five. Uh, why six? Well, simply because my Docker container, my Docker runtime is configured to use, only use six uh, cores of my 12 cores, right? So now what I have, uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna limit the resources that my container uh, can use. For that, I'm gonna use the minus, uh, CPU and I, I will just pretend that my container is only able to allow to use two CPU out of the six. And what we see here, uh, well, the GVM still see six CPU, uh, which is an issue because it only has access to one CPU to two CPU. And obviously, if I set it to one, it will still see six CPU. Why is that? Well, this is the color. Rate. This is the issue. I'm using a very old GVM that is not really a container aware. So to fix that, I need to look at my Docker file. So what we are seeing here is ergonomics in action. So for that, I'm going to change and I'm going to, instead of use Java latest, which clearly you should never use Java latest, that image is not maintained anymore. You should use, you can use uh, OpenGDK latest. Let's build the container again. Let's run it with one CPU and here we'll see that, yep. So this is a more recent uh, version, 17, and it has access to one course. So the command for joint pool is set to one. Uh, obviously, if I give it more course, like four, it should be set to three. So we see that in this case, the ergonomics of the GVM are working correctly. And in the previous example, that was an issue because my GVM thought that uh, it had access to six CPU, although it only had access to one. So you can pretty sh be, you can be sure that at some point in time, the Docker, the container runtime will uh, kill that uh, process. So that is trying to over consume resources that it has access to. So this is true uh, for the GC also, for example. The GC is also configured based on the resource uh, that the GVM, that Hotspot has, has access to, and so on and so on. So basically, this is uh, ergonomics in action. Now, let's quickly uh, have a look at CDS. For that, I'm going to connect to uh, Linux uh, VM and have the same uh, hello world application. So it's it's basically a Unix box. So that's why I need to connect to a VM. So uh, Java C, hello world. Oops, oops, what's that? Uh, let's see. Java C, I said, hello world. Let's run that application. Java, hello world. Again, doesn't really matter that VM has only four. CPU, it doesn't run inside the container, doesn't really matter. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use the time uh, to have some rough idea on how much time it takes to run that application. And I'm gonna disable CDS. So the application is taking like 120 uh, milliseconds to run. Obviously it varies from time to time, 39, 127. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna enable CDS. For that, it's pretty easy. CDS is enabled by default, so I just need to remove that flag. And this is the same application with uh, CDS. And you see, well, we went from 120 milliseconds to 70 milliseconds. Obviously, this is a very trivial application. So you should not necessarily expect that kind of huge boost uh, with your application. But nevertheless, whenever you use CDS, your application startup should be reduced.
even uh, in containers. Now, let's quickly talk about some of the GDK uh, tools. Uh, for that, uh, I need to quickly talk about the container startup. So you probably know that a container is made of different layers. If we look at a, J a, con a Java container, it has basically three core layers. That's the Java application, the Java application layer. So basically your code, your Java code and its dependency. Then we have the Java runtime layer. So the GDK or the GVM, if you will. And then the operating system layers. The key idea is that if we want to reduce the startup time, we need to make sure that those layers are as small as we can. Now, uh, at the Java application layer, there's not really much that uh, we can do. Uh, we can only give advice. For example, watch out your dependency. Make sure that you're not bringing transitive dependencies that are not needed, for example. You should also probably try to leverage some of the uh, layer cache mechanisms that are provided by uh, containers. So it might be a good idea to avoid fat jar, for example, and so on and so on. Now, if we continue to uh, move, look at the different layer, the operating system layers basically try to use a slim uh, operating system base image, a lightweight operating system base image, and also make sure to secure it. Now, when it comes to the Java runtime layers, uh, the advice would be to use, please use a GRE. I mean, to run a Java application, you don't need a full-blown uh, GDK. Now, you probably know that uh, there's no uh, GRE anymore. The good news is that since uh, Java 9, we have the ability to create our own custom uh, Java runtime that will only carry the bits that are needed um, to that are needed to run our code. So let's have a look at how it, this works. So for that, I'm going to leave my Unix uh, VM. And I will simply use Jlink uh, to create a custom runtime. So uh, I need to first specify uh, what is what directory my runtime should be put in. So my runtime. And then I, sp I need to specify what uh, modules I want uh, to uh, carry to have. And here I will be pretty minimalistic. I will just use Java base. Uh, let's see, uh, jlink output, my runtime, add modules, so java base. My runtime, modules. Okay, if we look, we have this my runtime directory, which include uh, like 48 files. If we look at the size, uh, my runtime, my, uh, so, sorry, that's, U, it's H, it weight 42 megabytes. So basically we have a super lightweight runtime that can run any Java application that is only using the Java based modules. So if we go there, let's uh, first look if my application is still there. Uh, let's compile hello world. My run, CD my runtime bin, well, bin java class pass hello world and that runtime is enough to run my small hello world application so uh, i have a 42 um, a java runtime uh, 42 megabyte runtime that can be used to run uh, some basic applications obviously that was a trivial example uh, nobody is really in the business of writing hello world application so what I did, uh, just as an illustration, I picked the Java SE modules, which is basically just, uh, which is uh, a list of, t well, 21 modules. And in there we have HTTP, uh, we have Java based, uh, we have some security stuff and so on and so on. So from that, we can already build uh, some solid Java application. If we build, if we build uh, using Jlink uh, custom runtime, uh, with those 21 modules, we will go from the full GDK 300 megabytes down to 88 megabytes. And so that basically means we go from 100%, so the whole GDK, to just 29%. And that runtime can run any Java application uh, that is using the Java C modules. We can uh, still keep decreasing the, the size of that runtime by removing, for example, the debug information or uh, by using some compression. That's something that you will have to look at. But you see that the benefit can be huge. And also, from a security standpoint, it's always a good idea to only carry the bits that are uh, needed 
uh, to run your application and nothing else. For example, most of the time, it doesn't make sense to carry a uh, J-Link or, uh, I don't know, uh, the J Javadoc tool or uh, Java C just to run your application. Uh, the idea is that if you remove all the bits that are not needed, you will basically reduce the potential surface attack of your uh, containers, which is always a good idea. Now, um, let's quickly talk about uh, some practices. You might have heard of multi-stage uh, build uh, for containers. That's something that is super convenient uh, when we combine so multi-stage build and a J-Link. So the idea is the following one. So um, you start from a, uh, from a base image that includes all the tools that you need to uh, build uh, your application, your Java application. So um, you get the source, uh, you build it and so on. And then you're going to use J-Link uh, to create a custom runtime for that application. Now, uh, you might wonder, how do I know what modules is needed for my, for my application? Well, um, there's a tool for that, uh, JDEPS. But it also happened that if you are, for example, using uh, some microservices frameworks, most of those frameworks have the ability to uh, generate for you uh, a Docker image. And in some cases, they can also generate a J-Link runtime, a J-Link based runtime for your application. So you don't have to wonder about which modules are needed. Anyway, in the first stage, you build your application, you create uh, the custom runtime using J-Link. And then you start from a secure, slim uh, uh, base operating system image. You just copy the bits that you need from the previous stage. And that's basically uh, your containers. That's the one that you're going to run uh, into production. Now, moving on. Um, some headlines that we saw over the, over the last few years, uh, clearly they are uh, a bit uh, catchy, uh, if not clickbaity. But um, for example, the top 10 of the most popular Docker image each contains at least 30 vulnerabilities. The good news is that Java was not in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are immune. Uh, another one, uh, Mystery Meet OpenGDK, sorry, Mystery Meet OpenGDK builds strikes again. So OpenGDK is open source, so anybody can basically take the source build it and claim that, uh, for example, that specific version is the GA, so the final one, even though it's not necessarily true. So at the end of the, of the day, uh, it matters. Uh, it's important that you choose, you choose your GDK distribution, your GDK vendor wisely. Uh, and don't pick any random GDK that you found on the internet. So we, Oracle, provide two kinds of uh, builds for the GDK. So we are providing the Oracle uh, open GDK builds under GPL v2 with a class pass exception. And we also provide the Oracle GDK uh, builds. So those are commercial builds. So they, uh, so you can get a commercial grade support for them. But starting GDK uh, 17, you can also use them for free. And we also have these nice script friendly URLs that you can easily, uh, that you can use to easily integrate those into your uh, CI pipelines. Uh, so, key takeaway here, only rely on actively supported GDK. Don't pick any random GDK. Um, now, uh, regarding the base image security, there's always the pull versus build uh, question. I don't have a good, any good answer. Personally, I prefer to build my image from scratch. But again, choose your base image wisely. Uh, these are some of the base image that contains uh, GDK builds that you can use. And always make sure to secure them. When it comes to image security, well, always start from an hardened image, reduce potential surface attack of your image. Uh, multi stage build is a good tool for that, uh, jailing and so on. And also make sure to secure it. Um, there are a bunch of security scanner tools that you can use. Uh, since GDK 15, we support uh, rootless containers, so Cgroups v2 in the, GD in, in the GVM and so on. And also, it's about common sense. So, wrap up. So, a lot of investments have been done since years to make sure that Java and the GVM works nice and behaves correctly into containers. It's basically the old mantra. Write once, run anywhere, including into containers. Now, something I didn't mention, all the new investments, such as, for example, Project Amber, so all the new features that you have in the Java language uh, also leak into containers. You can use them, obviously, into containers. Now, 
make sure please to choose your base image and GDK wisely. Make sure to only rely on actively supported GVM and secure your own containers. And with that, I'd like to thank you.